Uh, let's talk about language for a moment. What is language? Why do we need it? Uh, when it comes down to it, language basically means having a mutually agreed upon body with a common understanding. So, for example, most of us sitting in this room agree that what you're sitting on is mainly used for sitting and you agree to call it a chair. So, in that perspective, we now have a common ground um, and with that common ground we can now communicate and we can collaborate, in theory. That doesn't mean we always will. Quite the opposite, exactly. Imagine if you would, a group of people, and that group of people is occupying the same space. That could be a geographical space, that could be a physical space, that could be a political, a mental, a religious space, occupying the same space. And just imagine that this group is looking for certain identifiers. For argument's sakes, I'll be using identifiers here coded by colors, but you can also fill in the gaps by different political parties, different religious movements, people who do sports, people who don't do sports, academics, rich, poor, etc. Just imagine for argument's sake that one part of this group comes to the realization that the color orange is of supreme importance to them. And they identify by that because it's so important. And let's also say that another part of that group doesn't care so much about colors, doesn't care about orange, or let's say they identify by the color blue. So now you basically have two groups. You have group one, an orange group, and you have group two, uh, a blue group. What happens now is we're at a critical tipping point because if we don't watch carefully, the language pattern that these groups employ can lead to isolation, leading up to two separate camps which can end up fighting with one another. I'll take you down this dark road right now in the next few minutes. What that means basically is while the orange group still maintains, so your own group, still maintains the benefit of a nuanced and differentiated view, the other people who you don't care so much about, who you don't talk so much about, who you don't see as being in your own group, they start to appear more homogenous they start to become more blurred before your own eyes. You can see this pretty PowerPoint effect here. Great, right? So the other point would be that at that moment, it might very well be feasible that group orange thinks, why should I care about group blue? They don't belong to me. Why should I care about other people? And the communication breaks off. That is to say, the direct communication breaks off because, of course, the orange group keeps communicating, but they keep it among themselves. That means, of course they're communicating about themselves, of course they're communicating about the blue group, but they're doing it from their own perspective, with no direct confirmation or disconfirmation. That means, instead of talking to and listening to group blue, they are talking about group blue. And that is a fundamental difference which will eventually lead us down the path to violence. And this is where it becomes really dangerous. Um, what we're talking about here is a process of depersonalization. Because suddenly, you stop seeing the individuals in the other group, and you start seeing the entity of the entire group. I'll show you what I mean. Near the town where I grew up, there is a bridge. And on this bridge, there is a sign. And th that sign saying, basically, on this bridge, in the year 1919, a sailor, Kurt Lange, was killed here by the reaction, a political movement at the time. Notice the language, di the language difference. We have one specific individual, and he was killed not by another named specific individual, not by a specific assailant, not by an individual assassin, but rather by the political movement per se. That means as this sign insinuates, the political movement per se is to blame for his death. So, I guess, it's okay to hold him accountable. Another very, very simple example would be that during the Vietnam War, the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong groups uh, came to be referred to as mainly codenamed Charlie by the US groups. Thereby, referring to all of them by group name Charlie, you start leveling all these not so subtle and different nuances between them and putting them all on one uh, simple playing field, no matter how they feel about themselves. 
And by the way, um, that became a code name for all non-Western groups which were identified as code name Charlie. And as you can imagine, as a soldier, it makes fighting war far more easy by pointing a gun towards code name Charlie rather than being in a fist fight or a knife fight with Mr. Nguyen over here. So that helps in a sarcastic sense. What does that further mean? Well, let me take you further down the path. Let's further assume that uh, we have two biological concepts now um, fitting in the puzzle. The first one would be the concept of groupthink. Groupthink, put very simply, means that a group tends to reaffirm the preconceived notions it has beforehand. So, for example, if I pick up my uh, elder daughter at school and I find over there a group of boys talking about a certain type of toy, a car or whatever, and they like that car before they start talking about it, there's a very high probability that they like the car even more after they discuss that in the group. Why? Because they reaffirm their peak preconceived notions. Pretty simple. In terms of identity, you can get what I'm aiming at. Of course, the orange group will, over time, discoursing among themselves, reaffirm their orange identity and reaffirm that they are orange and they are not the blue guys. So the self-affirmation and sense of identity goes up, especially in definition to a other. What does that mean? That means that one group may, when there is no direct communication, very easily end up um, in asserting truisms, in thinking we are right, not we are more right or our perspective has some merit to it, but we are absolutely right. By the way, we are now paving the way for fundamentalism. And of course, living in a binary world as we do, if we are right, what does that say about them? They are wrong. They are not only wrong in the sense that they are erring, but they are wrong in the sense that they are wrong in themselves. The blue man is wrong. The entire group is wrong. They're down a wrong path. They're on the wrong side of history. You know the words. That means this is where it becomes really dangerous. In religious terms, we're talking about anathema. We're talking about these people are banned. These people should be cut off from our community. What does that mean? Now we have a second biological concept fitting in. Basically, our two million year old prehistoric brain tricking us, fooling us into evaluating things we perceive on a regular basis as desirable or benevolent. For example, um, there are tens of thousands of children in German and European streets affected every year by car accidents. That has a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons is that as a culture, my impression at least, is we don't evaluate cars as something really dangerous and potentially life-threatening. Why? I assume, because we're so used to the sight of them. The other side of that would be that things we rarely perceive, things which, we, which are rarities to us, things which are alien to us, things which somehow look not familiar to us, these things are seen as undesirable and even so potentially harmful. The evolutionary logic behind that is, I think, pretty clear. What does that mean? Well, in a group context, that sort of depersonalization might actually lead straight down to aggression. And this is where you have to be really careful in your own language. Why? First of all, the less common ground I perceive to have with you, the less I will care about you. What does that mean? Some of you, if you remember in recent memory, we had this uh, hurricane season in the Houston area, in the Texas area, where about, to my knowledge, about 80 casualties uh, were reported. At the same time, we had the 2017 monsoon season in Southeast Asia with up to 40 million people affected and several thousand casualties. What happens is, to my perception, that the uh, 77 casualties in the American uh, society are reported on the 24 news uh, cycle for days on end and generate headlines on end, while, to my knowledge, you have to really look focused to find reports about this mon a whole monsoon thing. That is, unfortunately, a normal biological instinct. 
The second thing would be that we tend to depersonalize. That means, as we've seen before, communication breaks off. Instead of talking directly to you and listening directly to you, I talk about you. So I face away from him and there's no direct communication. What does that mean? That means instead of a you, he starts to become a they. Let's talk about them, let's talk about him, let's talk about her. So basically what we're doing now is that we're having one chapter of knowledge about him and we're interpreting that one chapter to be the entire book. And the third step, and this is where we are straight down on our path to violence, is that a tendency to dehumanize sets in. Dehumanization means at that moment where my communication to him is cut off, it may be feasible under certain circumstances that he denigrates from a they, from a him, to an it. So it's no longer the blues, suddenly it's the blue group, the blue man, the blue surge, the blue threat. And we depersonalize that in our language and thereby legitimizing ourselves to take violent action. What does that mean? Let me just give you uh, some very brief historic examples about that. Um, we know these speech patterns being employed in South African apartheid, where black people were altogether, as an entire group, being uh, referred to by the exonym of John. That means white people, or Europeans, refer to black people as John, signifying servant, while the white people had to be addressed as Bas, Afrikaans for boss. So what you see here is to see two people, two men, coming up from a publicly available restroom, of course separated, and it might be entirely feasible that at the moment they reach the top of the stairs that the boss turns to John and basically says something in the vein of, hey John, why don't you go over to the grocery store and fetch me some soap? And of course he'd have to oblige. So the, uh, so the message here is, at that moment where the name is not even considered, in the direct communication, he's effectively deleting his identity, saying, I don't care about your name, I don't care about your heritage, I care about that to me, you are a servant. Another very drastic example would be in 1961's East China, during Mao Zedong's so-called Great Leap Forward, where we had in the uh, eastern Henan province, um, the experiment taken, the experiment in quotes, that Mao Zedong not only stripped people of their heritage, cultural revolution, not only stripped people of their families, reallocating them geographically, but also legally tried to delete their identities by taking away their names and replacing them with numbers. As you can see, fairly simple here, you can see 119 as a number on this person's back, and 266 on this person's back. Keep in mind, though, that we're not talking about workers, we're not talking about political prisoners, we're talking about normal, everyday citizens like you and me. Another example. During the uh, 16th century surge um, uh, in Middle and in South America, where Europeans came to claim that land, it seriously took a bishop and a theologian, Bartholomé de las Casas, to honestly point out <laughs> that the Indio natives, right, are actual human beings. They're not objects, they're not animals, they're actually human beings. It so took someone to point that out. Apparently that wasn't self-evident enough. And of course, how could we forget, during Nazi Germany, um, we have several recounts of SS officers taking part in the genocide committed at the concentration camps, coming home to their families in the evening, as, as if that was a sort of normal daily activity, I presume. And afterwards, being questions about that, we have recounts on the vein of, and I'm paraphrasing here, there's not an exact quote, um, reporting about the people they're committing genocide on. Quote, they have ears, they have eyes, they have hands and feet, they look like real human beings. Sometimes I have to actively remember that we're dealing with animals here. Strange, right? So what does that mean? That means as soon as the blue group is seen by the orange group as threatening their own identity, the orange group may feel compelled to exercise a horribly 
twisted notion of self-defense and thereby thinking they are righteous and justified in deleting the orange group, also physically. How does that show itself? First of all, by violent thought patterns. I'll talk about that in a moment. Violent language patterns. And of course, violent behavior, destructive behavior, actual physical violence displayed towards Group Blue. One very prominent exa example of that would be in the 19th century Australia, where the indigenous um, native Aborigines were seen as a threat to the newcomers' territory demands and had to be deleted from the map, and they were hunted for sports. As you can hear some, see here some uh, heads displayed as trophies for a sports hunter of Aborigines. And another example in our own time would be the horrible Rwandan genocide, where suddenly uh, Tutsi neighbors weren't perceived as neighbors anymore, and not one hut standing next to the other, but suddenly seen as a threat to the Hutu identity and had to be deleted. Well, what does that mean? It means that actually, as you can see, fairly simple, we're talking about a global phenomenon here. We're not talking about something that happened in one particular place or one particular stretch of time. We're talking about something that happens at many places at many different times. So I would claim something that is universal to our human nature, something that is deeply ingrained in our human condition. What do we do about it? Let's, rest let's retrace the steps. The first step would be that blue doesn't seem to share a common ground with orange. And at least orange is very clear about that. The second step would be, accompanied by feelings of fear, disgust and hate, that orange, in some way or another, seems to think that blue is threatening their own identity. The third of four steps would be that the blue group is being objectified, is being depersonalized, is being dehumanized, is being reified. That means they are seen as some sort of anonymous, malign, threat to our own identity, leading to the emotional consequence of emotional self-defense ending in physical violence. Okay, so how do we deal with that? Obviously, I don't have the perfect answer. I don't, and I don't claim to. I do have some questions, however, and a couple of suggestions, and I would like to share them with you. Number one of three would be that the language we use the soft skills, the communication, the words we use are based in a large frame. They're based in the frame of our behavior and they're based in the frame of our thoughts. That would basically mean that it's pretty hard to change another person's behavior. It's already difficult enough to change our own behavior. It is, however, far easier to, th to change our own thoughts and thereby influence our own communication and our own words and thereby affecting the communication of the other party automatically. I'll show you what I mean on four very quick examples, and to those of you watching at home or those of you following in your classes or watching on a mobile device, you'll find a link later in the description with some practical tools you can use in your everyday language to trace back in your own language and in your own communication, are you using language that could lead to violence or if you're suspecting something like that, where can you pinpoint that down? I'd very much caution you to be aware of making generalizations. That's obvious. A generalization would be, for example, the sentence that all blue people are X. That's a generalization. Instead, if you can, be prepared to differentiate. That takes more effort it takes more emotional strength, let me be totally honest with you, but that would be questioning a generalization. Who exactly did one wear wet? The other one would be, um, be very careful of making claims. For example, a very simple claim here would be, uh, all blue men are, <laughs> or let me tell you what the blue man is about, I know what the blue man is about, the blue man is about X. Instead, really try to listen actively, ask questions. Don't assume, but rather ask the other person, tell me, what are you about? What's important to you? I want to know. I'm not promising that I'll understand, but I'll try to listen. Please try to explain to me. Number three or four would be, 
be extremely cautious of asserting roles. Asserting roles would be, uh, for example, saying to a member of the blue party or of the blue movement or the blue tribe coming up to you and saying to him something explicitly or implicitly on the effect of, you are a member of the blue tribe. That is what you are to me. To me, you are a representative at, at the blue tribe. So basically, I'm going to use you as my vehicle to communicate to all blue people. That doesn't work. Rather, ask them. Ask them for how do they perceive themselves. Ask them in what role and what kind of identity are you here to communicate with me. Just ask them and they will answer. And the final one, number four, and I have to explain this. Be very careful uh, when you're speaking in terms of fixed states. A fixed states would be using um, the verb be, the verb is. That would be a saying something like, blue is always X. By saying that, you're basically limiting the group and the person of blue to the very confined space of the identity you're prescribing to them. You're not leaving them much room to breathe. And by the way, you're not leaving your commu communication much room to breathe either, and yourself. It would be much more productive if you were able to shift and by the way, you can read more about that later, if you would be able to shift and think in terms of processes, think in terms of dynamics, think in terms of adaptables. For example, not saying blue is always X, but rather differentiating and breaking it down into a process, not from a being, but a process, differentiating it down into blue does or blue did. Why? Because by that way, you're not limiting the identity of the other person to one specific action or to one specific perceived aspect of their identity, but you're recognizing for yourself, by the way, that that is only one chapter in the entire book. And you give yourself permission to question and read the whole book. What does that mean? It means, I would argue, that in the future, we have to be much more sensitive and careful about the language we use. It means, uh, that does mean not only paying mere lip service to communication, that means actively making the effort and trying to listen to other people. It means recognizing the common humanity in us and it means trying honestly to see, hear and feel the individual person sitting, standing and communicating next to you. That idea is truly not new and it doesn't have to be but it is an idea worth spreading.